guys, welcome to Chef Grace's place. Today we have Chaffee from Chaffee's Tiki Bar and Mookie. Um, Chaffee and Mookie have a great YouTube channel. His videos are hilarious. He participated in the Nacho Bowl 2020 challenge. And um, I mean, they're just so funny. He dressed up as the Colonel. He dressed up as uh, Elvis. It, his nachos were were great. Um, so I really wanted to interview him. Actually, my I think my mom is probably your number one fan now. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> she's like, when are you? She's like, when are you gonna interview Chappy? <laughs> um, so I was really happy to get you on the podcast. So do you have? A background in comedy at all? Oh no, uh, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I actually when I, I used to work on the cruise ships, and um, I would send these postcards home with the, like true stories, and everybody just thought they were hilarious, and they would keep these postcards and. Uh, and, and I think everyone's like was saying, oh, you should write a book like these are hilarious. And of course, I never, never wrote a book, but I, I guess a YouTube channel would be the next best thing. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, people listen to audiobooks now anyway. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so is that how you came up with the idea for Chappie's Tiki Bar? Um, no, like I, I di didn't even think of doing a YouTube channel. Um, I had a friend, um, this is a couple years ago. So he, he had, uh, quite, quite a good job. He was like a director of accounting for a major uh, grocery chain and he got a package and part of his package was, um, he couldn't work for two years, but he could get and, and this is probably all full like disclosure. A, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't, shouldn't uh, say anything because he's probably in, in a confidentiality agreement, but um, I won't say his know. name. It, yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, he came and he continue? said... Hold on. Um, your oh. microphone is like... Oh. It's, it's like... Uh, I don't know how to... Well, yeah, yeah. Or, like, or should I reduce the gain? I don't know. Those are uh, that that's coming past my technicality. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, reduce the game. Reduce the game. Yeah, like at the end of every word, it kind of gets like staticky. Is that oh, what okay? That, you know, because I know this. I actually upload this to also uh, Spotify and iTunes. So oh, you just okay. listen. Oh, that's way better. That's way better. Okay. All right. So. All right. I'll start over again. <laughs> so, um, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, how'd you get started with the channel? You're talking about a grocery store guy, and oh yeah, so I had a good friend. Um, he he was a director of accounting for a major grocery chain. Um, he got a package, and so basically he was sort of out of work, but he um, he part of his deal was he couldn't work for two years and he kind of came to me and he said, well, do you got any business ideas? And I think he thought because I like to cook, um, we'd open a food truck or he just wanted some kind of uh, advice or ideas as what he could do for the next two years. And I said, well, why don't we do a YouTube channel? And originally, um, and I had the Tiki bar already. Originally it was going to be called Tiki talk with Brad and Chad. Um, but, and it would we, it'd be basically like he, he, he's a funny guy. He likes to joke around. And I, I think it would just have basically been me and him getting drunk at my tiki bar and making jokes. <laughs> but uh, I don't think he was that comfortable in front of the camera. So it never really materialized. And then so I decided to do, I wanted to do a travel channel. And I released my first video or what my first upload in uh january like the end of january 2020 and then i did a few episodes where i was in hawaii and then of course the pandemic hit and i'm like well it's not, <laughs> not really good to do a travel channel during the pandemic so i just kind of uh, added a few things 
And uh, Mookie seemed to be popular, so I kept her along for the ride. So. Oh, she's so cute, of course. <laughs> yeah, she's the star. Especially when you do the uh, the special. Do you have a background in uh, the special effects, or you just? Oh, I just bought like a software. Uh, I just put Mookie's picture in there and it looks smooth. I, I kind of got the idea. There's a, I don't know if you've seen it on YouTube. Uh, there's Pluto, it's called Pluto Living. And it's a little dog. She tells stories and she's probably got like a million followers. <laughs> Easy, Mookie. <laughs> Healed. Healed. <laughs> she's a vicious dog. <laughs> she's a ferocious guide dog. <laughs> Come on. Um, so you, what did you do on the cruise ships? Um, I started out in the gift shops and that was just for the, my first contract. Then I worked in the casinos. So I actually went to Las Vegas and trained as a casino dealer. And, um, I have a good friend. Well, late, later on, I, I met a friend that worked in Vegas. Um, but I, I was kind of interested in working in Vegas and um, I went to like an immigration lawyer and I said, well, like I, I took the training um, and, and it's from that particular school. It was like a 90 percent hiring rate if you knew blackjack, 100 percent if you knew craps. And I, I knew both uh, blackjack and craps and went to immigration lawyer. And I said, well, like, can I can I get a job in Vegas? And they're like, yeah, no problem. You just have to find somebody to marry. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that was kind of an issue. So I went back to the cruise ships. Uh, I did uh, like another 12 contracts uh, in the casinos. So. so you're Canadian, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just got to, you know, let the viewers know. They're like, immigration, where's this guy from? <laughs> like, <laughs> what's that boot? <laughs> <laughs> what's that boot? <laughs> um, so that's pretty cool. Can you do all the card tricks and stuff? Um, I can shuffle chips, and I, I, I knew, know a few things, like, a, um, well, I don't have any chips, but I can do um, where, where you have four chips, and you, like, twirl it around and separate it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Do, uh... it's useless, but it looks cool, so. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a skill, you know? Yeah. For, especially for a bar, you know, a bar chick. <laughs> yeah exactly <Bar> <laughs> um so did you learn the tiki bar was just purely because you had a tiki bar in your house or did you uh, well just my all my travels like i just uh loved the tiki culture and like by the way it's it's like america an american invention like so the first tiki bar was a guy by the name of don beach and he was from los angeles so basically it was supposed to be based on South Pacific or Polynesian culture, but it was just his perception of what it was. So um, the Polynesian food was like Chinese food, but he served Chinese food just because it looked exotic. And then so this tiki bar craze caught on and, and I think it had to do a lot with like the soldiers in World War II or whatever they were in, stationed in different tropical places and then they came home and they kind of wanted some kind of escapism so that that's how this tiki bar culture craze started and then I think it kind of died down and it's sort of picking up again yeah I think for a while it was a uh, you know kind of tacky like yeah well that yeah it's like kitsch or whatever yeah but uh yeah now it's picking up again but it's also um you know, it's probably going to be controversial because <laughs> talk about cultural appropriation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think as long as you pay, a, you know, you pay homage to uh, the cultures that it comes from. Then it oh, comes. yeah, yeah. Like, I, I love Hawaii. I love Hawaiian food. And I, I try to do a little bit of that. And... So what places do, have you gone to? Well, I, well, just working on the cruise ships, I've been to over 100 countries. So I did like a Mediterranean run. I, I've done, done Alaska. I've been pretty much everywhere in the Caribbean. I've been, done Asia, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, I've been all over the world. It, it really is a great way to see the world um, for free. Like the, the pay isn't great. Like if you're, you're basically working for tips. So. Oh, yeah, the pay is 
I looked into that because I became, uh, you know, I, I went to culinary school and I wanted to see the world. I knew I wanted to see the world, um, you know, even as a little kid, because my father was a pilot and he would come home and he'd have all these stories about Peru and even just like Nebraska. I was like, Ooh, Nebraska. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted, you know, so I wanted to go see what was out there. So a lot of people were like, oh, you should go work on a cruise ship because it's, um, you know, you'll get to see the world. But I didn't like the idea of uh, it's like just kind of being on a boat for like six months or three months or whatever the contract was like yeah. being uh, not being able to like s- separate work from you know where you were so like being a flight attendant it was very similar but you're only on the plane for like 10 hours you know (laughs) so is that how you met your boyfriend uh as a flight attendant or no i met my boyfriend in um eighth grade gym class his friend was in front of me (laughs) wow yeah and i made fun of him but uh he uh we, we didn't get together in uh high school or anything we just okay. uh, it was always the will they or won't they but uh, uh you know when i came back from college my friend was like oh you should give him a chance and i was like no <laughs> <laughs> and we've been together ever since so i'm like and you did uh, some kind of martial arts or something when you were in uh, school or yeah i was very competitive in uh jujitsu i uh uh-huh. Yeah, it was uh, my brother and I, they had the, it was like at the beginning of what, like what MMA is today, like when the UFC started oh, getting wow. popular yeah. is when I was doing that. So there were many girls, like I wanted like eighth grade, I was like, I'm going to be an MMA fighter. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it was probably one of the only times I wasn't like, I'm going to be a chef. And um, we had fought. And these, they're the North American Grappling Association was like one of the only tournaments in town, basically. Like they, they have a couple of different tournaments now, but like, like associations basically. But back then that was the only one um, in the country really. And we, um, you know, we were, I was ranked, like I would go back and forth between like first and second with this other girl, but it was a point system. So I actually like, I never fought her until she, oh, okay. she now, was, was, was she like a nemesis or did, did you, was it a, a friend? Like a friend? Was a, I didn't really know her that much because oh. she was so much older than me. Cause they just, uh-huh. school, um, like I was 14 and she was, uh-huh. she would, was turning 18. Um, Oh, so she was a lot older than me and um but it was all by weight Mm -hmm. and because everyone under 18 they didn't separate the genders so i i was like 125 pounds so i was fighting guys that were you know they were in they're in puberty already they were growing facial hair and everything (laughs) and i'm uh you know i was winning like I was placing first. So it was, um, and my brother was, he, he was a lot lighter than me. So he was, um, but they would separate the points. It, you had to fight the guys, but then when they did the points and they ranked everyone, then they separated the genders. And I, that always bothered me because I'm like, if I have to fight them, I should be ranked with them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, anyway, do you do martial arts? Is that why no, you ask? No. I, I, when I was young, I played hockey and baseball. Now, my niece, uh, she's kind of like you. She, she turns 13 in July, and she, she's a pitcher for, like, a fast pitch, and she's going to be playing with 16-year-olds this year. So I think she's going to get a college scholarship. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's great. And but, those pitches, uh, are, those are hard. Is it baseball or softball? Um, well, it, it's, it's underhand fast pitch and the ball's like that big. So I think it's kind of in between baseball and softball. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah I, I remember it's, it's the one where you see all the college, the colleges play on ESPN or whatever. So. Wow. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, now you said, uh, so you just have the one brother or. Yeah. We're, uh, we're twins. 
Oh, okay. He seems like an interesting guy. You said he's from Nevada? No, or he lives in Nevada? I mean, we're, both, we're all from New Jersey, but he, uh, right. he just bought a house there. He's, um, I'm actually going to visit him uh, next week. So I'm trying to actually probably, I will probably post this interview next week when I'm in Nevada. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, so. Is he close to Vegas or not really? I, I think so. He's in, I've never, I've been to Las Vegas once on like a layover and I have, okay. he just moved there. So I was there for like, I don't know, like 15 hours, but <laughs> 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 from what I remember, <laughs> but uh, he was um, living in LA for a while and then they bought a house in Nevada and he's opening a jujitsu school um june 1st it's in henderson nevada okay yeah that's a suburb it's a suburb so yeah, yeah. i don't i don't really know anything about it i'm gonna find out next week <laughs> so but he's having um but he has a two-year-old baby girl or about to be two oh, okay the time probably won't be hitting the casinos too much so. well my mom and my um and her fiance are gonna go to the casino like i'm gonna hang out there and they're gonna go for because we're staying for like a week so they're gonna go hit the casino so if you have any recommendations for him well, I, i'm i'm mr vegas i've probably been there over like 30 times so yeah if you got any uh food recommendations oh lots um there there's um uh, hmm, let's see I, I guess you you know what like the, all all the buffets are kind of closed right now. Um, but my favorite buffet was the Cosmopolitan, uh, and the name of the buffet was Wicked Spoon, and it was like a really super foody type buffet because it had all the like little portions, and you could get like uh, like squid ink pasta and bone marrow, and, and and it was just totally geared towards foodies. So I, I don't know if it's still open, but if it is, that, I, that's by far my favorite buffet. What about not buffet? Um, oh, there's there's lots of cool places. There's uh, I go go to this place called Batista's, and it actually the name of the restaurant is Batista's Hole in the Wall, and it's it's just an old school Italian place. And uh, you can pour your own wine. I think they got these big leader things of wine where you just, and, and it's just a like continual wine. Um, and then there's another place uh, called Bootleggers and it's actually towards Henderson. Um, Anthony Bourdain went there and it's another like old school Italian place, but it's more of a like, steakhouse and then, but they have like lounge singers and stuff. And, and it's, it's really like, kind of how old Vegas was, like with Frank Sinatra and all those guys. I mean, any place that's good enough for Anthony Bourdain is good enough for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. <laughs> so when you were traveling around, what like, what were your favorite places to eat? Is anything? Well, I think, and that's kind of what got me into food. Like uh, I, I wasn't really a foodie before I started traveling. Um, like, so, and, and I, even before I worked on the cruise ships, um, when I was in uh, college, I did a exchange program in Japan and, uh, I, I could, couldn't imagine myself eating sushi or raw fish, but then just sort of out of necessity, I started, you know, I started liking it and tried other foods and, um, ba basically everywhere I go, like it, it's really good indication of you get a good sense of the culture and the people just by their food. And, and even like from a, like say you go to a hot country like Mexico, um, they have spicy food. There, there's a reason for it. Like the, the spice makes them sweat and it's a cooling mechanism. Um, all, all kinds of things like that. You can really see how people live and get a sense of their culture just by food. Have you ever made any uh, like custom mistakes when you were over there in Japan? Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, there's like so many little nuances. Like, you, 
you if you point with your chopsticks like that's very rude um actually there there was a funny story so i i was uh doing like a student exchange and i was living with uh, a family and um we were all at the table and they, they actually had a dog looked a little like mookie but they just love this dog they had the, a, a little high chair like a baby high chair so the dog could sit at the table and eat with us but for some reason and it was like these chihuahuas they they don't like other people and the dog just kept on like growling at me through dinner and then um after dinner the mother um brought like dessert and she brought me these little, little cookies and and she she i think she was implying i should give a little bit of the cookie to the dog just to kind of make friends with it um but i took the cookie and i was eating it and of course the dog's growling at me and then i look down at the the package it was it had little pictures of dogs on the package so i was eating dog cookies <laughs> <laughs> how did they taste uh pretty stale <laughs> and then needless to say the dog didn't love me after i ate her cookies so. <laughs> oh man <laughs> So, um, that's so funny. I, I remember when I was a kid, we had a little toy poodle. And I remember I, I, they, we used to give him milk bones. It was a dog biscuit brand here. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I remember tasting one once. I'm like, this is disgusting. I don't know why you like this. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he got a... Because yeah. I always uh, like branding dog food as like delicious for your dog. It's like they're lying. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not us, basically. <laughs> but I, I actually, when I, I I started cooking when I was in college, I lived with like four guys, and so like one di guy did the cleaning, other, other guy did the cooking. But I was terrible. Like uh, I remember one time I was like, "Okay, boys, I'm gonna make uh, poached eggs," and, and I'm like, "Well." no point in like boiling the water and then putting the eggs in. I'll just put it all in, in a pot of water and let it do it to work. <laughs> so it was just like shredded egg soup. So we had <laughs> shredded water egg soup. It was probably the worst meal anyone's ever had. <laughs> what kind of food do you cook now? Um, well, like um, I have an, uh, on my mother's side, she's Italian. So I do a lot of Italian cooking and um, I like Mexican. Now, I prob probably prefer almost Tex-Mex or <laughs> authentic Mexican, but uh, um, yeah, a lot of Mexican, a lot of Italian. Um, no Canadian? Uh, the, yeah, I guess there's poutine. <laughs> so, now, uh, let me ask you this. So, I, I, this might be before your time, but in New Jersey, I hear Disco fries are, are popular. Is that something? Is that a thing or no? Oh, my God. Disco fries are the best thing ever. They're, oh. But there's there's like a, there's a secret. Like, so Noelle and I love disco fries. I got to do a disco fry episode. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for people who don't know what disco fries are, it's like after you go to the discotheca basically um and you're drunk and you go to the diner because you have to have them at a diner because it's new jersey and <laughs> um you order disco fries they're french fries with like a beef gravy and mozzarella cheese on top and it's just the combination of like the stretchy and the crunchy and everything but what we found is depending on the diner you can order disco fries with waffle fries instead of regular fries and it takes it to the next level. It's so good. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause it would just hold everything. It'd be like a basket of goodness. <laughs> yeah. But then it has the little slots. So they're still crispy and you get the texture. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So good. Cause sometimes you get a waffle fry and you pick out a fry and then everything like slides off of it. You know? <laughs> so it's really good. I'm sure they would also be really good with sweet potato fries, but Mm. you know we don't want to mess with the tradition too much <laughs> <laughs> and the, the other thing i read um the reason why new jersey pizza is so good 
is uh, when the Italian immigrants came over, um, they were used to these super sweet uh, tomatoes, like uh, San Marzano tomatoes are grown at the foot of Mount Vesuvius and they have extra rich soil. So they have these super sweet tomatoes in Italy. So when the immigrants came over to New Jersey, the, the tomatoes weren't that sweet. So they added sugar to their sauce. And that's why New Jersey pizza sauce is a little sweeter. Do, do you it's, find that or? No, um, no. I find that in South Jersey compared to North Jersey because there's okay it's a real regional thing <laughs> yeah it's super regional but um they use they'll use like it's not they're not they don't add sugar like some people do add sugar to their tomato sauce but that's not um it's that's i think that's more of a uh i forget like probably if that didn't come into like much later i would say that because what sugar wasn't was too expensive to just throw in the sauce i think oh, okay yeah um but it, they have different varieties of tomato because new jersey is w one of the best places to grow tomatoes just oh. where the soil is i mean i'm sure mount, Ves mount vesuvius obviously very good tomatoes but <laughs> um the it's the variety of the tomato. Um, in South Jersey, they use a lot of plum tomatoes, which are way sweeter than like a beef steak or, you know, um, the one that I'm forgetting the name of right now. <laughs> but oh, the, uh, yeah, the Roma tomatoes or yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, you know, they're a lot sweeter. So in South mm. Jersey, you see that in their tomato sauce, and the sauce is super sweet. But in uh, the northern parts they don't use plum tomatoes so it's not sweet huh. but that's why the north has better there you go because it's sweet <laughs> you don't really want it to be too sweet because you need the acid to cut through the yeah of the cheese you know so but, but there, there was something uh that came out the number one pizza place was or the number one state for pizza was new jersey and new york was actually number three Connecticut was number two. <laughs> I believe it because a lot of people, um, like where I'm from, not not during my time, but I guess my parents' time, or even you know their parents, they settled in Newark, New Jersey. Um, so there's a, a huge Italian American community there. But it's also such a, it's such a melting pot. Like <laughs> there's the Italians, they don't like, they kind of moved out of Newark. They moved out of Newark now. There's not many left. Um, and they're in, you know, other parts of New Jersey, uh, especially the town I come from, Nutley. Um, had, it has so many pizzerias that we had a, a pizza like war contest every year where you would go in and you pay five dollars and you taste all the pizzas in town so i think one of the reasons why it's just so good is there's so much competition and it's not um where like new york is probably third because they kind of have this commercialized idea of what like little italy is supposed to be like you know what i mean yeah so they're kind of whereas if you're going to New Jersey to get pizza, they're just trying to make the best pizza. So it's a it's a little different. And there's all different kinds. You got the thin crust. Some people like it a little thicker. Like I call it the Ninja Turtle style pizza, <laughs> like <laughs> in the comic book, where it's just stretchy cheese everywhere. Um, but there's like, it's just such good pizza. I can't wait. My friend, uh, Logan just became a uh, spirit flight attendant and he um he just got a layover in newark and i'm like oh my god i gotta go over i gotta go up there with you and take you to all the pizza places <laughs> all the diners yeah oh, the disco fries i want some disco fries now <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, i don't even what is poutine um so it's fries with uh i, I guess a brown gravy and cheese curd and it, it's actually huge in Montreal and Quebec and the, the French provinces. Uh, here, like you can get them at McDonald's and stuff. 
stuff, but uh, I, I, I think they're probably much better uh, out east. And, and also, like, so Montreal has the poutine, and then they have the equivalent to, uh, like, New York City deli, but they call it Montreal smoked meat, which is fantastic. Um, so it's, it's just like a pastrami, I think, um, at a deli, but uh, it's specific to Montreal. Wait a I mean, the New York style delis are pretty much Jewish delis. Yeah, yeah. So is that Jewish too? Or is I, I'm pretty sure like they, they do have uh, quite a large population in Montreal. Um, the, the big one uh, is called Schwartz's Deli in, in Montreal, and, and they're, they're quite famous. They actually, um, you can buy the, their uh, Montreal smoked meat in grocery stores now. Uh, they're so popular. So. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, if you if you ever get up to Montreal, try a Montreal smoked meat sandwich. Once this pandemic is over, I'll yeah, everywhere <laughs> again. Hopefully, um, the we our uh, flight attendant union, we might be getting our jobs back. So oh, okay, yeah. Then I could really have a uh, travel YouTube show, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but. So you said you moved. Did you move to in Canada or did you move to? Oh yeah, just on the other side of the city. So, uh, so I, I used to do um, my tiki bar in my girlfriend's basement, and now um, I, I have I'm I'm just in my apartment right now. So yeah, I thought you moved to Hawaii because I saw oh. the tropical stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then That's I thought the you, you, were doing, um, you were like at a farm or something. Um, oh, is that the one with the cow or the, yeah? The, um, so yeah, my parents live out in British Columbia and that's where I do appies with Chappie by the lake. Um, and, and then, uh, I went, he's kind of a local celebrity. His name's Buddy the Steer. He's six foot five and 2,400 pounds. So I, they, they think he's the second largest steer in the world. <laughs> and, I, and I just, uh, kind of walked onto the property and, uh, and I was surprised cause he, he, the, he came right over to me and I kind of made friends with me. <laughs> So super friendly steer. That's so cool. Did you feed him any uh, dog biscuits? Yeah. <laughs> no. So I've come a long way with uh, bonding with animals since then. So. Oh. So uh, how did you get Mookie? Um, actually, Mookie's a rescue dog from Arizona. Um, wow. Yeah. So, uh, uh, she was at like an sort of like a orphanage here in Calgary. They were trying to find a home. So, uh, and my girlfriend, she had two older dogs and she, she had lost them tipsy and cammy. So, um, and she said, promise me I'll not to let me ever get a, a new dog. And then she saw Mookie and fell in love with her. <laughs> How did you get, um, how did Mookie get from Arizona to Canada, though? Uh, it was so, some kind of agency. Um, so they paid up to fly them. Um, and then they, they, they stay at like a foster home, they call it. And then they, they find them homes. Uh, so that there's this nice lady uh, named Barb that lived at her foster home. And then um, we, we sort of had like sort of an interview process, just like a regular adoption, I guess. And then she came to our house and made sure it was safe for Mookie. And then we got to adopt Mookie. Um, and then funny enough, um, we met up with Barb like a couple months later just for a walk. And she was walking some of her other dogs and Mookie tried to bite her. So... <laughs> She, she saved Mookie's life, and Mookie, Mookie's uh, very ungrateful. Yeah, Mookie's well, like, it's cold up here. I want to be in Arizona. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so where's the first place you want to go to after the pandemic? Well, it, uh, like, I've been just, I've so far I've canceled two trips to Vegas. I, and like I said, I, like I'm Mr. Vegas. I usually go like two or three times a year. And then, so, so that was a whole thing. Like um, I had this flight to Vegas and then they, they, they uh, changed it and then, and then they canceled it. And, and I, it took like a year to get my money back. And then um, 
So I, I'm thinking Vegas might not be as good as it was, like just because of the buffets and they might not have an, enough shows. So I'll pro- the last place I went was Hawaii. I'd probably like to go back to Hawaii just because it was so awesome. Have you ever been to Florida? Yeah, well, uh, I had a cruise ship based out of Florida. So yeah, I got got lots of stories about the Clevelander on South Beach. And uh, yeah, I, I used to hang out in Fort Lauderdale quite a bit. So yeah, I love Florida. Um, there's a place in North Beach, I think. Uh, it's called the Marco Polo and it's right on the beach. Uh, I stayed there quite a few times. It has a balcony o- overlooking the beach and and uh yeah, and I'll always rent a car. I'll always get a convertible when I'm in Florida. So, and then I, I love the Cuban food there. It's fantastic. And and I actually know a guy from Cuba, and he says the the Cuban food food in Florida is better than Cuban food in Cuba. Um, but I think the actually the Cuban sandwich was invented in like Tampa or something. So probably because they. Um... You know, you don't have to deal with the rations and the. Yeah, I think that that's a lot, uh, a lot about what, why it's not the food's just okay in Cuba because they just don't have the ingredients. Uh, but... Yeah, well, they have it, but it comes out of yeah. price. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> but like on the cruise ships, um, we we'd leave Miami and we'd pass Cuba. You could actually see Cuba like on the right hand side. I probably passed Cuba 150 times, but I've never actually been to Cuba. <laughs> but back then it was because we all, all the passengers were Americans and they didn't want the Americans to go to Cuba. So. You know, when I was little, I like, I didn't realize that it was just the Americans that like kind of go to Cuba. I thought like everyone couldn't go there. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were you know, completely isolated like we don't want anyone coming here and then like and then like I just never thought about it after that so then when America started going to Cuba and they were talking about all the other countries that are were already there you know what I mean and mm-hmm. I was just like huh I didn't realize like if you're British you could go to Cuba <laughs> and they got me all these great all-inclusive packages you just go stay at a resort and you get a choice of like five different restaurants and uh like three different swimming pools and 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 it's it's all inclusive some of them like even your drinks what's your favorite you said you went everywhere in the caribbean what was your favorite experience there um i guess well or not favorite but yeah, like so. The, my favorite run was New York City to Bermuda, and Bermuda is unbelievable. Like they have these uh, beaches with little speckles of pink sand, and then all the houses are pink color, so they match the sand. <laughs> it, it's it's just like visually stunning there, and it's it's a British colony, so like a lot of they got a lot of cool pubs and and British food and. And, and I guess my, my other favorite place in the Caribbean would be Aruba. Um, mostly just because it like, well, again, beautiful beaches. And then they had a lot of casinos there. So like, lots of stuff to do. Uh, but I should probably tell you, I am obsessed with New York City just from that. So that run um, every Saturday we were um, in New York. So I, and I did it for six months. So I, I had 26 Saturdays in New York. So I'd always get off the ship early and make a point of like just seeing everything. So like Empire State Building, Statue of Liberty, did all the tourist stuff um, and just fell in love with New York. Like I grew up in rural Alberta. So just it's just like to me, it was like being in a movie with all the taxi cabs and like Times Square. Like I just and so if you look here, like it's all Hawaii and Tiki stuff, but my uh, living room is decorated with a New York theme. So I have pictures of myself in New York. I have paintings in New York. Um, yeah, I just I just love New York. You have the shirt that says I love New York? I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, that's so funny. I remember, because growing up in New Jersey, I grew up, you know, like, that was, that was the city. 
that when you're going to the city, they're like, that's the city you were going to. And I just didn't, I mean, I lived in Philadelphia for a while and that's an amazing city too. But, um, and it's a big, it's a big city. So I, I didn't realize, I remember going to uh, like Denver before, I mean, it was like before the marijuana boom really happened, like just at the start of it. And I was just like, this is a city, you know, I had never been to a city that was spread out before. That's what it uh, was. And it was just so strange to me that like, this isn't a city. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Where are the skyscrapers, you know? Yeah. But uh, it's, yeah, it's just so overwhelming. So, and when you like, when you go into this, it's just like, like I just going into the tunnel and you come out of the tunnel and it's like New York City. It's crazy. So like I didn't realize how uh, not everybody had that experience. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because you're just used to it because it, it was normal to you. But New York, it's like, and you're gonna go back to New York, and it's gonna be, it's the, still New York, but it's gonna be so different. You know, mm. every time, every time you go, yeah, yeah. You see something new. Yeah, I guess I guess Vegas is kind of like that too because it's always changing and evolving. But I'm a, you know, I hope it, a lot of people are leaving New York right now. So I hope it, uh, it bounces back. Yeah, for sure. But it's, um, you know, I was watching these documentaries. I think I was, wa- I was watching something about some murderer, I think. Son of Sam. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and it, but they go back and they, uh, you know, they have all the interviews from like the 80s or something. And I was like, the accents are so much stronger back then than they mm. are now. It's insane. Yeah. Like, I thought, like, people tell me, like, oh, wow, you have, a, like, a Jersey accent. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's like coffee. Like, woo. But yeah. um, the accents were insane. I was like, oh, my God. People, like, people talk like that, and it's like, you really do you hear yourself it's so funny but i think it's because they didn't have the internet yeah so like you know i'm talking to you right now but like we have different accents and everything but i don't think they're as strong because we just constantly hear everyone else talking like right like, well this is crazy and you can really uh, you can really hear the um the melting part of the melting pot with like the the Irish and the Italian accents coming together. Yeah. Like, well, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> but do you speak any other languages? No, not at all. I took French in school because we had to, but yeah, it didn't really stick. <laughs> and I tried to learn Italian for a little bit, but uh, yeah. But what about Japanese? You stayed there, no? Yeah, I took a I took a language class when when I was going to school there. So like I I, I could pro- form sentences and stuff. So. But yeah, um, not I, I think if I will learn a language, it'll be Italian eventually. But and I should, probably should have did it during the pandemic because I had so much time. But uh, def, definitely want to learn Italian. Is that because your family is Italian or? Um, yeah. And, and I did, and that was an, another place I just loved going to on the cruise ships. Like we did the Mediterranean run and uh, we'd go to Naples and Venice and uh, a place called Shitavecchia, which is just outside of Rome. So we, you could take the train into Rome and a smaller town called Livorno. Um, that, that was one of my favorite meals in Italy uh, there's just this little tiny place in Laverno called the Pink Panther and they had these handmade gnocchis uh, in, in sort of like a sausage sauce it was just, and it's just like a family restaurant it's probably one of the best meals I ever had in my life well part of Italy is your family from um I, I can't remember the exact town but it, it is northern Italy and actually, that, that's kind of a funny story. Um, and it's kind of, so basically, my family w- was in the bar business uh, 
for probably like 60 years. So that's sort of my drink making background. Like I'm not, I'm obviously a home bartender. I'm not a professional bartender, but my, my family was in the bar industry for 60 years. So my great grandfather came over from Italy in 1928. He worked in the coal mines for a year. And then he um, started running whiskey across the Montana border. And the next year he bought three hotels. So you do the math. <laughs> And then I, I ended up working at one of those hotels when I uh, probably aged 15 to like uh, 24. Um, so I like I worked in the bar a little bit, wasn't so much a bartender, but I worked in a liquor store, worked at front desk. And, um, so that's kind of my background in drink making is uh, my grandfather bought a bar in a hotel in 1928. That's pretty cool. <laughs> my uh yeah my father's father they're from italy so they're from northern italy and they um but they used to do like shenanigans like that like the italians are always doing some kind of shenanigans yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they, i think they had a like a little speakeasy thing going on in yeah the, in the I guess so my my great grandmother would do all like the cooking and stuff and then I remember there was a story about um selling like boat rides up the Hudson River <laughs> like, <laughs> for tourists. they're always doing something ridiculous um that's really cool so they would he would run the whiskey over so, yeah so I, uh, where I grew up is, is like an hour away from the Montana border um so a prohibition yeah, it was during Prohibition, okay. so, and he, I guess he was working for the Italian Mafia, He's so a lots of money. <laughs> literal, literal bootlegger, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, a rum, rum, rum rudder, only it was whiskey, so. <laughs> What's your favorite uh, spirit? Um, Probably just a, like a good Canadian whiskey, like, uh, oh, Crown Royal. So th this is... Uh, made in canada i think they they made it in honor of the queen so <laughs> uh and and where i'm from alberta like that's like when you're a teenager or early 20s that that's just what everybody in alberta <laughs> drinks is uh rye whiskey um i used to drink it with rye and coke a lot of people drink uh rye and ginger or a rye coke press with a little bit of water and uh, yeah, the bar, the bar I worked at, like the, everyone drank the, the Ryan Cokes or, and this is cool. We had, because it, it opened during the prohibition, we had these beer glasses and it had a, a line on it and it, it said ALCB, so Alberta Liquor Commission or whatever. So by law, you had to fill the beer up to the line um, but this is from like the thirties or forties, but they still had the glasses. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So, so it, this bar was like super old and, and then there was a partition. Um, you, you could just see the, like basically where the partition was because I, I don't know the forties or fifties, the men weren't allowed to drink with the women. So they had a whole section where the women had to go and and then the other the whole other bar was just for the men only <laughs> what yeah Canada, you got, they separated the men and the women yeah i i don't know if it was just uh be, i yeah I, I don't know the reasoning <laughs> the whole point of going to the bar <laughs> yeah yeah this was like in the olden days though so <laughs> they, they just still had the partition there to... is that a uh did they do that? I don't think they did that in America. Okay, I have to look that up. I'm not sure. Separation. I mean, uh, obviously there were other separations. Yeah, it, it was just something my grandfather told me because my grandfather took over the bar from his father, and he said, "You see, you see that little like nub there? That used to be a partition where they separated men and women back in the olden days." So. <laughs> the um, I always thought it was interesting when uh, I learned about like a lady pint versus a like regular pint, I guess. Yeah. The smaller glass. 
I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> but of, of course it is. <laughs> Less beer for us. Twice the price. Yeah. I'm surprised it wasn't pink. <laughs> but uh, that's crazy. Oh, Mookie's sleeping. We're boring. <laughs> She's bored. <laughs> So what cocktails are you working on now? Um, I, I'm going to start to experiment with those old timey cocktails with uh, like egg whites, <laughs> but I haven't, I haven't quite been brave enough to, to do that yet. But, um, and then I'm going to do, I'm heading out to the, out to BC quite soon. So I'll do some appies with Chappie by the lake. So I usually, when I'm out there, I just like whatever I have, I try to, I, I keep, I keep a bartender's guide. So it's really easy to find drinks. Like I, I just basically figure out what I have. And then I look at the bartender's guide and figure out what I can make. Cause like we're, when I'm out at the lake, it's, it's, we're, it's like 20 minutes into town. So if you want to go get a lemon, it's like a 40 minutes bad both ways. So. That's uh, pretty cool though. The lake, the lake, that lake is beautiful. Oh yeah, yeah. It, uh, it reminds me of Norway a lot, actually. Ah. Is he in Norway? <laughs> the, the pine trees are like, huh? Must be on the cruise ship again. <laughs> no, it's a, a big thing right now. So I'm in Alberta. Uh, the lake's in British Columbia. So we're because of the pandemic, like we're fully locked down. Um, but we have different laws in Alberta than British Columbia or different rules. And in British Columbia right now, like they don't want you to leave your health zone and you can get like a $500 ticket. If you're like, say you, you, you want to go camping a hundred miles away. <laughs> so, and, but they're, they're not really enforcing it, but it just seems like the people in BC are nuts right now. They hate people from Alberta <laughs> and I've ha had friends, they, went to BC and they'll get their car keyed. They'll get nasty notes. Uh, like on the, on the news, there, there's like people that they'll have Alberta license plates and they'll get attacked in a parking lot just because they're from Alberta. So it, it's, uh, but the, it's, it's mostly the politicians and the media from British Columbia. Like you, you, I watched the Vancouver news in, in BC and and a lot of it's just how bad people from Alberta are about like not social distancing or not wearing masks and stuff. And, and it's just a small percentage of Alberta. Like they recently had this illegal rodeo in some small farm town, but it, on the news, it was like, well, people from Alberta are throwing illegal rodeos everywhere. <laughs> like I live in Calgary. There's a million people here. Like the, we're not like on some farm. So it's yeah. always the rednecks, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. But the, uh, yeah, they, they couldn't. They would just go insane if they were in Florida. It's the uh, wild west over here. They, oh yeah, I bet. <laughs> no rules. Like there was like a pandemic for like a week in Florida, and then they're like, eh, do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so most people wear masks, though. I gotta say, most people yeah. they they're good, but. Um, we get a couple people that are like, I don't believe in masks. And I'm like, eh, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You know, have to <laughs> just, yeah. But in, and then in Calgary just yesterday, so uh, the fine for willfully not wearing a mask was a hundred dollars. They increased it to, I think 500. So, but like they said, like, if you just forget to put your mask on, they're not going to find you. It's just if you're, I think if you're outside protesting, not wearing a mask, you're going to give you a $500 one. That's, yeah, that's tricky with the, but I mean, I've gone out before and been like, oh shit, I forgot my mask. But, yeah, you know, it's not a, I just stayed in the car and made my boyfriend go get everything from the store. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it's just not, um, you know, there's so many other things to focus on. And I feel like the politicians are just trying to divide everybody with that. It's like stupid things like that, like rodeo and whatever, like instead of figuring out how can we make a safe gathering, they're just like no gatherings. And I don't think that's right. That's yeah. The way to do it. 
you know. Yeah. And and then like they're the politicians are making decisions that health of experts should be making, I think. So Yeah. And then, you know, in America too, a lot of it is like, well, the health experts, their money comes from the government and the politicians are running the government. <laughs> yeah. So they kind of have to, you know. Well, it's pretty controversial here because um, they, they just came out with those mask rules. So the politicians um, that made those rules in in December, there was a huge controversy because they all went on this holiday to Mexico, just like Ted Cruz or whatever. And, and uh, <laughs> so some of them got fired and some of them got in trouble, but like they, they, there was this order not to travel, a no travel ban, and, and all these politicians went on holidays to these Caribbean countries in Mexico. So, yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. Yeah. And they, you know, and once the, there's a lot of people getting vaccinated now and it's just like if you they still want everyone to wear masks but i yeah. like i understand that because then you have you can't just unfortunately you can't be like oh i trust that you said you got a vaccine that you actually got one you know what i mean because yeah. there's people that'll just say they got a vaccine when they didn't get a vaccine and then right yeah you know, but people people are starting to get upset about that. Like, I got my vaccine. I don't want to wear my mask anymore. And I'm like, yeah. no, I, I just got my first AstraZeneca shot. Um, I think that's the one Biden didn't want, so he sent a bunch to Canada. <laughs> uh, and it, it it kicked my ass the first night. Like, like I, I was fine, and then like I, I kind of got chills, and my stomach was woozy. But I, I guess in a way, I, like, I, I was glad because I, I knew it was working. I didn't get like, a, a placebo shot or something. So, um, And then supposedly they're going to run out of that one. So, And I'm, I need a second shot for that one. But um, we'll see how that goes. They might change it where you can just mix and match your, your vaccine. So, But, uh, yeah, so I, I'm happy I got the shot. Both my parents got their first shot. My dad has some health issues, so we're... We're glad he got his first shot. So, I'm getting the uh, the Johnson and Johnson tomorrow, actually. Okay, and that's a one and done, or yeah, it's a one and done. Um, there's some stuff in the media about there there were some uh, issues with like blood clots and stuff. But yeah, that was the AstraZeneca as well. So yeah, but I just think um, you know, reading it. Unfortunately, the the eight women that got. I kind of like matched that description, but at the same time, it was eight out of, you yeah. know, um, millions or something. <laughs> like, right. So, um, or, you know, super high number, but it's, uh, it's just not going to be, it's very hard for my boyfriend to like take off of work and stuff. So it just would make more sense to be one and done, I think. Yeah. And, the, you know, the, the risk was it was less risk than like being on birth control. So I was just like, yeah. <laughs> well, they said you can get blood, blood clots from uh, COVID as well. So, yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, my, my boyfriend tested positive before. And, um, you know, when I came back from the, I came back from Thailand in March. And that's when people were finally paying attention in the United States. Right. Yeah. And I was I was sick, and um, I was trying to get tested, and I couldn't get tested anywhere. I went. <laughs> I tried so hard to get tested, and yeah. I was, you know, trying hard to get tested, and you're like, you know, you got a fever, and you're sick. It's just so annoying. But um, I went to the hospital, and I was like, I think I have COVID, and they're like, you know, they're acting like you're hypochondriac because yeah don't and then they start asking you all these questions and i'm like like well, you, well were you out of the country you know what i mean and i'm like yeah like i was just in the country that has the second most cases of this <laughs> disease like wow. um, so then they got scared but they didn't know what to do yeah so they left me in like a makeshift quarant like a decontamination shower that was like out by the ambulances for like three hours while they tried to figure out what to do with me <laughs> and 
then they didn't even they took a sample they um you know they stuck the thing on my nose but they um they're like okay we'll test you for strep and influenza and if they come back negative we'll test you for we'll send the sample to the cdc and test you for covid and they both came back negative and they never sent the sample out to the cdc oh geez. and then they hit me with a 300 dollars bill because we don't have health care for our citizens <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? So that was terrible. But uh, so I, I probably did have it because then when Noel got it, I, I didn't really get sick again. And I was, you know, I live with him in a tiny apartment. Like, yeah. I'm going to catch it. That's what yeah. I'm going to catch it. <laughs> so, oh. This will be like a booster shot, I feel like, <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> so this should be fine. Oh, Mookie. Is there like a window right there? Is he enjoying or is she enjoying? Yeah, that? every once in a while, like a cat will go by and she'll start barking. So, how old is she? Uh, I think she just turned seven. Seven? Yeah. So, so she's an old lady now. Yeah. Dog years. Yeah. My, my um, girlfriend's other dog, she would have been 20 years old yesterday. Wow. <laughs> so he lived to, I think, about 18. So, Wow. Yeah. We had, uh, our dog lived to be 15. The smaller dogs live a lot longer. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Is it something about the, the hearts don't have to work as much because they're smaller. Okay. You don't have to pump, pump the blood as much. Yeah. This um, one's pretty lazy. She doesn't do a lot of heart pumping. So. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. So, all, all your, um, everything on the wall behind you, is that all from your travels? Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's Hawaii. I think that's, I was in Aruba, uh, Hawaii, um, Aruba, Hawaii. This is actually, well, this is a good, um, you can't really see it, but it's a, a mermaid tank. So there's this tiki bar in Great Falls, Montana. And they have a mermaid tank with live girls dressed up as mermaids swimming in the background. So it, it, it's pretty famous. It's called the Sip and Dip. Um, I think a long time ago, Maxim Magazine ranked it as the top bar to travel to. So, um, but there, there's a, a, a sad uh, part of this story. So um, it's just this fantastic tiki bar has a mermaid tank. And um, there's a woman there, her name's Piano Pat, and she's been playing an organ there since 1963. Uh, Piano Pat just passed away last week at 84 years old, but she was still playing in, in that bar as of like recently. Wow. And uh, I think she, ha she had a fall in August. Now, I'm not trying to make light of it, but she actually... I think she broke her hit, hip, but she hit her head on her piano in her house. So <laughs> the piano may have killed piano path. <laughs> oh <That's> <laughs> but yeah, one of my favorite bars all time. And actually, the, and I do have a funny story with that. Um, so the, uh, Great Falls, Montana is just across the border from where, where I grew up. Um, we growing up like we'd go down there for like uh school shopping and stuff because everything was way different and cool and cheap and uh so my brother when my brother's getting married uh, we had we decided to have our his bachelor party in great falls montana and uh did a lot of golfing and drinking so we go to um the sip and dip bar where the, they have the mermaid tank but it was during the day and um, we go to the bartender. Um, is there any chance, like this, it's this guy's bachelor party. Is there any chance he can get in the mermaid tank? <laughs> so the bartender's like, yeah, why not? And, uh, apparently, so it, it's a hotel and then they have a swimming pool on the, on the second floor. And then the first floor is the bar. 
and the, the, the swimming pool goes down behind the bar and then they just have a, a glass thing. So my brother, we're, we're having our drinks in the tiki bar and we look up and my brother's swimming around in the mermaid tank and he presses his chest against the glass. <laughs> did they put a tail on him? They did not, no, but maybe next time. Maybe next time. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> wonder what the, the pool is like. They have like the... Uh... You know, like the secret, the secret club. Where the yeah, club. it's probably full of uh, mer- mermaid disease. <laughs> I don't know where those mermaids have been. <laughs> that sounds like a fun bachelor party. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and then um, I think, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't divulge too much, but I think a hotel room got destroyed that trip, <laughs> so... <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. So. <laughs> uh huh. Sure, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I always get off topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was going to ask you a question about the lake, but I can't remember what it was. So, um, do people go swimming in that lake? Is um. It- yeah, it's pretty like it's Canada, so it's pretty cold most of the year like maybe like two months where it's warm enough to swim but yeah it, it is a good lake for swimming i actually own a kayak um and mookie's got a little life jacket she she likes actually likes kayaking like she hates everything else she hates being in the water um but though like i was taking her kayaking and then one time i put her life jacket on and she walked out of the house walked onto the beach and jumped in the kayak she was re- ready to go so that's awesome. Yeah, but I don't like doing the like the white water rafting or anything. It's just like a calm lake, and I go kayaking. It's it's almost like very therapeutic. Like you're just on this beautiful lake, and you're paddling away. And you you can, bring your tiki drink with you. Uh, should yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's nothing better than having like a drink by the water. I just that's my jam. I I love that. Yeah, it's really nice. I like, uh, you know, we go to the beach all the time. I got this thing. It's a, I guess it's a growler. It actually broke. I got to get a new one. But it had, um, yeah, it had like the cups on top as the lid. And it had like four cups and it was, it was like a gallon. So you could, you know, make a big batch of drinks and take it to the beach. And it's just so nice to have a, to be able to go to the beach because when I was, Growing up, like you can only go to the beach in the summer. Now you go all year round in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was interesting when I first came down here because in New Jersey, you have to pay to go on the beach. You have to have a beach pass and you have to pay like $5 a day or something like that just to go on the beach. So I would go on the beach in Florida and I thought I was like doing something illegal. <laughs> There's, there's like no one around they're like come on let's go on the beach and um you know you have like the sand dunes and everything so yeah. it's in the walkway to the beach so in new jersey there's always like a little kiosk where you have to pay and then mm. the cops will come around on the beach and check and make sure everyone's got a beach badge so and you get like a big fine or whatever if you don't have it so i was just like <laughs> you know like looking for the cops and like you know the cops they patrol the beach in florida but it, it's not for that but every time they would come i'd be like hiding <laughs> <laughs> i actually have a funny story um it, it's a florida story so uh same type of thing it was like it, uh you had to pay for the beach but um and th- this is like um I think it's sort of between Fort Lauderdale and Miami. So like the parking on the beach is like total ripoff. It's like, it's like a scam. And so my, my girlfriend, we were staying at the, actually at the Marco Polo right on the beach and she wanted to go, go for lunch. And the place for lunch was just like a couple blocks walk down the beach, but um, she, she didn't want to walk. So we drove <laughs> And uh, so right across, so there's a beautiful restaurant. There, there's a, a pier going out on the water right right on the beach. And the, the restaurant was actually on the end of the pier. Um, and then so I, 
right next to it was a, a strip mall and like there, there's a huge sign like no beach parking whatsoever you will be towed and, but I, I'd parked there before and I said okay well here's the deal let's just uh, go in the store pretend we're shopping in the strip mall and then we'll go for lunch and, and to- she totally doesn't listen I mean she she gets out of the vehicle she she pulls her beach bag out and she's just like walking diagonally towards the beach with the beach bag. <laughs> I'm like, wait, you're killing me here. So we 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 go for lunch, and then um, and then oh, so to get to this place, like yeah, I think you had to pay to go on the beach. I'm like, here, here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna cut through this hotel. We'll, we'll pretend we're staying at the hotel. So to get to the beach, we had to walk through the hotel. We had to walk through the pool area. And as we're walking through the pool area, my, my girlfriend starts pointing. She says, this says guests only. And I'm like, put your finger down. Just act like we belong here. So, so we, go, we go, we have a, a lovely lunch. And then on the way back, like she's making fun of me, like, ooh, people are watching us. We get back, sure enough, my car's towed. But <laughs> it was a total scam. Like they had... a. a like I, I, I think my car was towed within five minutes from when we left because it was at this impound place that was like forty-five minutes away, and they had already had my my vehicle there for quite some time. So I think they just had somebody watching this parking lot, and it was they're just waiting for tourists to park there so they could charge them like two hundred dollars to get their car back. And then, so I, ironically, I had to take an Uber to this place forty-five minutes away. And while my girlfriend was waiting, she went to the store that we were supposed to pretend we were going into. And she had a nice shopping time there. So. <laughs> yeah. Now, actually, it just makes more sense to Uber to the beach because the parking is so expensive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's not a. Yeah. I like, I like, I'd rather have my own car to go to the beach. Yeah. Not, not that I would drive it and make Noel drive. But <laughs> yeah. I mean, you get sand in your car too, right? <laughs> yeah, you get sand in your car. But, you know, I always feel bad, like, if I'm sandy in someone else's car, you know? Yeah, true. But... <laughs> you got something to add, Mookie? Oh, she's eyeballing something. It's not not much going out there. She And then I, I had this one short where she doesn't like Michael Buble. So for some reason, when I say buble, she growls. See if I can get her to do it. Okay, buble, buble. Who's that? Buble, buble. Uh, she won't do it. <laughs> it's like sometimes I'll just randomly say buble, and she'll start growling, and I can't explain it. Buble, buble, buble. Where's Michael Buble? <laughs> she doesn't like Michael Bublé. He's Canadian. What's not to like? Yeah. If he was from Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> so Michael Bublé. <laughs> I I am working on uh, this hilarious. I think I'll do it as a short, um, but. I, I'm going to dress up as the Hamburglar and Mookie's in charge of uh, protecting my Big Mac. And I think I can provoke her enough to bite me, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> oh my God. Are you going to, so you can make the Big Mac or is it just? Oh no, I'll just, I'll just, just buy it. funny sketches. How did you come up with the idea for the, uh, the nacho videos you did? Um, well, I, I had originally did a KFC pie, so I already had like the Colonel costume and stuff. So I, I made this awesome uh, pie where I just put the KFC gravy and chicken into into a pie. <laughs> it turned out fantastic. And then the, the oh the Elvis one, I, I had the Elvis costume because I made an Elvis shooter. But I actually on that one, I infused vodka with bacon. And it was disgusting. <laughs> Still, drank. it had like little fat droplets. It, it tasted good, like, but it just it was gray, and the bacon inside turned gray, and there was, and so it was coated with these fat droplets on top of the vodka. 
<laughs> but um, there, there is a place in Vegas called the Double Down, and Anthony Bourdain's been there as well, where they, they actually do that. And it looks exactly like that. They have this gray vodka behind the, the bar, and they do, like, bacon martinis and stuff. Sometimes, you know, they say you can put bacon on anything, but that doesn't sound very appetizing. <laughs> gray. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But, uh, I didn't get sick. I was kind of, well, am I going to get sick from this? <laughs> that's a weird texture, like the alcohol and the fat. like. Yeah, yeah. But I, And then I mixed it with like a, a raspberry liqueur and a peanut butter whiskey. So it was like bacon, peanut butter, and, and jam. So it was like, a, that's why it was the Elvis shooters. I feel like the whiskey would be better with bacon in it. And vodka. Yeah, yeah. That um that that baked or sorry, the peanut butter whiskey is very nice. I could just drink yeah. it on its own. I had a um a smoked maple whiskey. Oh. And that was amazing. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but I was just like, it's gotta be from Canada. It's maple, right? <laughs> I overdid it on uh, Honey Jack Daniels in Vegas once, but we were just doing shots and, oh, <laughs> it just it kicked my ass. Yeah, that's my uh, my boyfriend's favorite, Honey Jack. Oh, yeah. But uh, the maple, it was, it, I, it was like I was drinking pancakes. Like, it was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Like, Whoa, this is cool. I got to look it up. I'll send it to you. Okay. But uh, it was so cool. And then we were, I was trying to talk, like whenever me and Noel go out, we talk to the bartenders and stuff, you know, but he was just, he wasn't having it because we were just thinking about like all the different drinks we could make with this maple whiskey. And he was just like, I just work here. I don't like being a bartender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so funny. I'm like, all right. But that's so funny. So. Where did you get that tiki statue? Um, I got I got it at the. I think. Do you have Marshalls in Florida? It's like a, it, it's like a Marshalls type store. I thought it was called Winners. Easy. Oh, she sees another dog. Michael. Yeah. So, I, and then I got this is this is Fred. I got him at. Uh, there's a place called Canadian Tire. So it, it, it was more or less just like a lawn ornament for you, but. Uh, Oh, I thought you brought it back from a Oh, yeah, everybody thinks that. <laughs> I thought uh, <laughs> one hard thing when you're traveling. Uh, I was oh, yeah. so many things I wanted to bring back, and the, the shipping was too expensive. I was actually, uh, when we were in the, on the ships on, in the South Pacific, we were in, like, Bora Bora and Samoa, and I had a friend buy this. It was a tree trunk that was hand-carved. It was beautiful but it, it probably weighed like 200 pounds and he's working in this little on the ship and, and he's living in this tiny cabin with his girlfriend. Like it's like bunk beds and, and the, like the cabins about the size of this bar. So he's got this giant tree trunk and, and he's doing like a six month contract. So he's got this tree trunk Tur turned out. It was uh, when he got it back to the ship, it was okay. When he got back to the ship, it was full of red ants. <laughs> but he's, he was determined he wasn't going to throw it away. He wrapped it in like a cellophane or whatever. And then um, that, that particular ship later on, like a few months later, we were, we were in Europe and we we're in Vladivostok, Russia. And I think he paid like a thousand dollars to have it shipped from Vladivostok, Russia to where he lived in England. <laughs> But, and, but it was just a hand carved thing. Like you could probably buy it somewhere, but he got it like in Bora Bora. So he wasn't going to part with it. How's Russia? Oh, I loved Russia. Uh, the only place I ever went to was Vladivostok. And a funny story there. So I had a friend in Canada. He was teaching English in Korea and um, he wanted, and and it's just like a short uh, flight from Korea or Japan to Vladivostok, Russia. It's right on the water. And I, I think they told us you could actually see 
Japan from Vladivostok, Russia. I don't know if that was true or not. But anyway, so this guy, he, he goes, oh, you're in Vladivostok. He goes, when I was teaching in uh, Korea, we went to a travel agency and we wanted to go to Russia. And, um, but they didn't speak English. And we're like, we want to go to Vladivostok. They're like, no, no, no. And he's like, yes, yeah, we want to book a flight to Vladivostok. And then so the, the guy gets out this uh, English Korean dictionary and he reads it and he goes, do not go to Vladivostok, Russia, you will surely die. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, a, it's a big port town and there's a like a huge mafia presence. And, and, and I told him, I go, well, come to think of it, like I was just walking down, down the street, like there's all these poor people. And then there's this kid, he's about 20 years old. And he's sitting on a BMW with a suit and he has a wad of $100 bills and he's just playing with it. And I guess he was like exchanging U.S. cash, but he was like a heavy like jet or Russian mafia guy. So there is a huge like Russian mafia presence in this port town of Vladivostok. And I guess they have a re- reputation, but like a lot of port towns are pretty shady anyway. So. Oh, yeah. So it's always the port town. That's where everything, uh, you know, import export business right there. <laughs> you know, that's why uh, that's why that part of New Jersey had so many Italians, you know? Well, so, Sopranos, right? <laughs> yeah. That's uh, where I'm from. They, they filmed it right there. Oh, wow. <laughs> but um, yeah, they, they ran the ports. That's how they. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And when I worked in the, the gift shop, um, we, we would, uh, dock in, in New York city. Um, and then we, we basically had to wait for our supplies to, to come on to get, um, milky. I'll put her down. So, we, <laughs> so, so we're docked in New York city. So we, ha- I was working in the gift shop. We had to wait for, um, our inventory to come on and then we we just load it up and we'd have the rest of the day in new york city but every department had inventory so my manager was smart she knew like all the guys running the dock were like mobbed up so she she'd go out and talk to them Uh, she's like this blonde lady from england and she uh she worked in the gift shop so she'd give them these giant tester bottles of like Ricardo or clone <laughs> and, and they they just snap their fingers and we get uh, our load on first every single time and then we could spend the day in New York City <laughs> and then another good story was uh, so we're we're in uh, I was in time I think I was in Times Square where it was where they used to film David Letterman and, and I remember seeing on David Letterman it, there was a, a strip club across the street and David Letterman did a couple things. He goes, can a guy in a bear costume get into a strip club? And they filmed it. And, and then they had, he had another one where him and Marv Albert went to this that strip club and they were wearing berets and eating steak sandwiches. So I was like, we got to go to that strip club. So um, it's just me and a couple other guys from, from the ship. We we're just there for the day. And we're in this uh, famous strip club, like in, in Times Square or whatever. And... Um, there, there, I didn't really notice, but there was a, a guy at the bar and he was wearing a really nice suit, but he was getting a continual lap dance. And I think lap dances are like 20 bucks, but he had this lap dance going on for like three hours. And then finally the, the DJ comes on and he goes, Hey guys, don't let Joey the flower have all the fun. Get a lap dance. So he was like, come on. God, do so. <laughs> so. Who's your favorite comic? Uh, probably Bill Murray. I love Bill Murray. Bill Murray? Yeah. Do you see um, Zombie Zombieland? Ah. Did you see that movie? You like yeah, it. yeah, I haven't seen that movie, but yeah. Woody Harrelson and uh, yeah, Woody Harris, Harrison. Harrison. Harrelson. Harrelson. Yeah. Yeah. He's in it, but Bill Murray is a. Uh, you know, he's he plays himself in it. Is funny. Uh, <laughs> I think. Well, the the most classic one in this is before your time is Caddyshack. Um, oh, of course, yeah, Caddyshack. Okay. But and and I I was just saying the other day. So um, there's certain movies like Caddyshack and Animal House, especially like men in my age group. 
you can say any line from that movie and get a laugh. <laughs> but for Canada, that movie is Slapshot with Paul Newman. Uh, so it's a, of course, it's a hockey movie. But there, there's like 40 or 50 lines. And I can just say, pick a line from that movie and say it to someone in Canada my age and they'll, they'll laugh. <laughs> that's, that's true. Paul, Paul Newman was great. Yeah. I uh, I worked with um, I was running a cooking and brownie company for people like getting off off their feet with um, not Paul Paul Newman but the guy who ran Newman's Own basically yeah yeah um, they don donated a lot of money like when anyone retires from Newman's Own they give them um, like a half a million dollar grant. And, uh, to donate to charity to a charity of their choice so this guy picked my charity um to start a cooking and brownie business it didn't work out but <laughs> he tried his best that's awesome <laughs> um yeah it was really good working with that guy tom indo so i haven't heard from him and since then but because i feel like you don't know about like charities are just you know they're corrupt so yeah <laughs> so you know whenever there's a lot of money there's corruption so yeah yeah but uh you know he was a good guy yeah yeah i like paul newman <laughs> paul newman was a really good guy too so but yeah anyway <laughs> like you know slap shot i think for like i am terrible with movies like Noel's always quoting movies, mm. even Caddyshack, and I just don't um I don't remember the lines, but any girl, any like lady who's my age, I feel like we didn't really have a movie like that. Oh, until yeah. mean, mean Girls came out. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and every uh you know, if anyone ever goes like, You don't even go here. She doesn't even go here. Like everyone knows what that means. That's my yeah. age. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, uh, it's, it's well, always fun to have that kind of like cultural connection because you can do that anywhere in the world too if there's a, yeah and they'll know what it means it's great yeah. and then well when i worked on the cruise ship we had a crew channel uh and they'd show movies but they just show for that month they'd show the same eight movies over and over again and you turn the tv on just to have background noise but you you could do like the dialogue from one of the movies and i think at the time uh meet the fockers was on and my cabin mate he was from australia peak the meat and we we'd walk by and we call each other jinxie cat and <laughs> just say you gotta strike while the iron's hot and, but we like we just recite this dialogue and and just like laugh our asses off because we're like sitting in a casino at a dead table and just bored. So we're like say, saying dialogue from these stupid movies. <laughs> we had that with, um, that's one of the things I like about crew is like, it's a, uh, you always have like an immediate family, you know? Like oh yeah. Our trips would only be like a week long. And then like by the second day, like, you know, you know, everybody's life story. <laughs> yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why I like doing these podcasts is because I miss the, uh, you know, just like the, you'd be on the plane and the transatlantic flight, there's no like Wi-Fi, you know, like right. they sell you Wi-Fi and it'll work for like until you get to the ocean and then it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, good deal. <laughs> so we would, uh, you know, you'd have 10 hours that you have, you have to stay awake, you know, when you're on duty. So you would just learn, you know, you'd hear crazy stories just like this you just go back and forth and tell crazy stories <laughs> and then you would have your layover and you would make some new stories <laughs> yeah. it was it's almost like you develop your own language you like you could just say a word or or like and you know exactly where it's going yep it was uh you know it's a good time I, I hope i get to get go do that again but it'll be more fun because i'll bring you yeah. with me <laughs> <laughs> but I, like I, I, I quit, like I quit, I, I, I'm stammering. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, 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 I I'm trying to say I equate uh, working on the cruise ships uh, to uh, like living in a college dorm because there's just that setting where everyone's just kind of sitting in the corridor drinking we had our own crew bar and but you, you had to live in these tiny little cabins with uh, bunk beds like it and I, I lived actually lived with my fiance in one of those cabins for a couple of years so uh very very tight quarters yeah that that's the one thing i like about being a flight attendant over doing that it's like you really can't get away. Like if you get a roommate that you don't like and you're on a boat <laughs> in the middle of the ocean. Oh yeah. I probably lived with over a hundred different people from like every country. So there's like really good ones, really bad ones. Yeah. So I was, I, when I was in college, I had a terrible roommate and I was oh. like, I'm not, I'm not doing that in the middle of an ocean. Yeah. Um, so the good thing about being a flight attendant now at least i know back in the day they used to share rooms but now they don't oh okay um well i mean maybe it depends on the company but uh most of the time with the unions and stuff like you get your own hotel room you you know it's if if you don't get along with someone you don't have to you have to deal with them on the plane and then you can go yourself <laughs> So that's, well, that's the same with like the uh, passengers on the cruise ship. Like now I, I did have uh, a cabin mate. He was um, at the time, I think he was about 36, but he was into women in their like mid fifties and, but they, they'd be a passengers on the ship. And so they would wine them and dine them and buy them gifts. <laughs> and they're like very grateful. <laughs> But like for for the most part, like if you're a crew member, you, like you don't want anything to do with passenger on your time off. Like that's that's your time. You got your crew bar. <laughs> yeah, and then your time off is on the ship too. That's another yeah. thing. That's the yeah, one thing yeah. I knew. If I got on the if I got on the plane and someone was given yeah a hard time, I'm like, all right, ten hours. I'm not going to see this person again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, but then two like you're there for like two weeks or whatever. Oh my god. Or in three months, I don't know. <laughs> and then, that, like that type type of industry, I think so, sure you got like lots of stories about how, just how stupid people are. <laughs> like, we had this uh, one couple on the cruise ship. I think they they flew in from Arkansas, and their travel agent was selling the cruise. Like, oh, you'll have a cabin steward. They'll get you ice. They'll like they're basically your butler like the cabin steward will do everything for you just you just leave your um, bags outside the door and they'll take it right to the plane for you you just have to drop them outside your door and the cabin steward will take everything so the travel agent told these people this and and they thought they meant leave it outside their door in arkansas so they they left their bags outside their their house flew to miami got on this cruise ship and then the, the cabin steward comes and, hey, I'm your cabin steward. They're like, where's the bag? <laughs> <laughs> or, or like the um, one person uh, asked a crew member, uh, so do, do, you, do you guys live on the ship? And she sarcastically said, no, they, they have a helicopter, pick us up every night. So this lady filled out a complaint form that the helicopters were waking her up at night because uh, the taking the crew members off in the night. <laughs> we, I used to, they, so we had like a, this thing called the snack bar, right? And you could order snacks on the back of your screen. Yeah. And uh, this, we were out of, we used to, you know, for a, um, you know, a plane of 344 people, they would have like, 10 ham and cheese sandwiches <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um you know they would sell out like immediately so we would uh one lady's like all right so well when are you going to get more and i was like oh well you know we got to wait for the next shipment the when the you know <laughs> delivery plane will pull up i'll let you know <laughs> and she was just like oh okay and i was like <laughs> and then like then I was on break because um, 
the plane I was flying on was a 787. So we had uh, bunks in the top of the plane. So, yeah. so we would fly, like, if you're on the first shift, you would be up for like the first four hours and then switch with the other person, you know, and <laughs> go take a nap. So I got the second nap and um, the lady was like demanding to talk to me because I told her <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was serious. Mm -hmm. And um, oh man, I'm glad I was asleep for that one. But I got I got in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> like, you can't make jokes like that. People don't get it. <laughs> oh man, I was like, ah, whatever. But at least I didn't have to deal with her for a couple of weeks, you know? Yeah. Uh, my, but they would ask, so they, you know, people on planes, they, I think it's the low oxygen levels, you know? <laughs> they, lose, <laughs> they lose their brain power. Yeah. That, that was the beautiful thing about when I worked at the family business. If you, if somebody's rude, you just tell me off. <laughs> yeah. Throw like, them out. Uh, well, my grandfather was hilarious. Like he ran the bar and uh, one time um, this cowboy comes up and he's like, I lost a quarter in the jukebox. And uh, my, instead of like refunding him, like my, my grandfather goes, well, give me a quarter and I'll sing you an effing song. <laughs> customer service that they were accustomed to. I would. I would definitely take him up on that. <laughs> All right. Which lungs do you know? <laughs> yeah, we used to do, they would just do silly. Like people would always try to, um, there's like you would go towards the end of the plane and there would be like cabinets that like we could store our stuff in, you know? <laughs> And people would try opening it, what, like thinking it was the bathroom. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. like right in front of you, and like the bathroom would be like like right behind them. Could, it could have been the hatch to go. <laughs> yeah, You're like oh, you don't you don't want to touch that. Oh uh, yeah. Or there would be a uh, there was like a wall, and it had a handle on it, or just like like a to brace yourself mm -hmm. in case there was turbulence or you know, whatever. And people always thought that was the door to the bathroom. And then they would get to the bathroom and the bathroom doesn't have a handle. It's like one of those accordion type things. So you, but you push it and people couldn't figure it out for the life of them. And it would have a giant glowing hand with an arrow that would say push. <laughs> <laughs> It was just like, you didn't even have to speak English. And we would just sit there and we would watch them. <laughs> <laughs> that would make a good YouTube video right there. Yeah, I know. I'd probably get fired for that. But <laughs> 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 How to open the door. In a, or they would go, the worst though is when they would go in there with, um, like you should never take your shoes off in a plane. Like I get it when you take it off. Like if you're at your seat and you're like not really like, touching the floor that much fine yeah but people would get up and they would go in like walk around the plane in their socks or mm -hmm. barefoot and go into the bathroom and like they don't clean planes that well no <laughs> like it's like a public bus like they don't yeah <laughs> so and turbulence like like men stand up to pee and there's turbulence like there's pee all yeah there. exactly yeah. Like, and you're going to walk in there and people would just let their babies crawl around on the floor and stuff. Oh my God. It's hilarious. You're just like, Oh my God. They like, nobody's thinking, but I think now that there's a pandemic, maybe people will think more. Yeah. Well, that, like here's a, here's something to think about. Here's a casino tip. And this is probably uh, pre pandemic as well, but like with casino chips, like everybody touches them, people sneeze on them. They, when they get up, like they don't, they don't, it's like money. So they're going to, they'll take the casino chips to the bathroom with them. There's even, and I don't know if this is true or not, but there, there's, I've been told there's certain cultures where it's good luck to pee on their casino chips. <laughs> so anyways, when, when I was dealing 
blackjack or whatever, um, I would wash my hands before I went to the bathroom. <laughs> That's how bad those chips are because they ne- like they never clean casino chips. They probably do now because of the pandemic, but um, like back then, those those things were filthy. Well, even money too, like in the yeah. you know in the food industry, you never the person touching money never touches the food unless they're wearing gloves you know what i mean because the money is so dirty like people don't people don't get it like they're doing all the same things they do with the casino chips yeah they're doing it in private (laughs) (laughs) or in the strip club like they don't watch the money after it comes from the strip club oh strip club money would be the worst (laughs) (laughs) bada boom or what's the one in surprise bada bing (laughs) bada bing yeah yeah I think it's really called, it's a real strip club. It's called the uh, Guys and Dolls, I think. Okay. I actually saw like in, from, in Manhattan, you can take like a Sopranos bus tour and go to like the pizza place and the, like all the Soprano stuff they use to film Sopranos. Yeah, you go right on the, uh, the Belleville Turnpike and yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm like, I know where that place is. I know where that place is. <laughs> you can give your own tours. Yeah. <laughs> Even the, the last... Um, the last scene where they shot it in uh, Holstein's. Okay. The ice cream place. And like, I would go, that was where we went, like after a soccer game or, you know, like a event, like to get like ice cream, like that's where everybody went. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) And it still looks like that. They have a plaque now, uh, like at the booth that they sat at, like that it was filmed there. Yeah. It's definitely a, you know, a tourist thing, but. I think uh, I think the popularity is going to kind of like have a resurgence because they're coming out with that movie, um, The Saints of Newark, and it's oh. about um, Tony Soprano, uh, like coming up in the mafia as a kid. Oh, cool! So everyone in New Jersey is excited. Yeah. About I, th- I think in the t- the t- the TV show uh, he robbed a poker game when he was a teenager, and that's how he got the got it got going. And well, of course, then Uncle Junior was his uh, uncle, but uh, oh yeah, and his father was in it. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, his father got whacked. His his mother was a piece of work. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know a lot of those. Oh my god. So, it, but she reminded me of like. The uh, also like it, the stereotypical uh, Jewish grandmother too. Right. It's very similar. It's with the guilting you and <laughs> it's it was just like oh this is hilarious like it's just it was so uh I felt like wow this is, has got to be like super relatable to like <laughs> so many people. <laughs> <people. laughs> never come visit me anymore. Like it was so funny. <laughs> That was a great show. Yeah. I just saw the... Um, I was watching another movie. That guy is in a lot of uh, stuff now that played uh, Christopher. Oh, yeah. Michael Imperioli or something like that. Yeah. I was like, wow, you're old. he's old now. I saw oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I just watched this with the first season of The Sopranos recently because I was like excited that the movie was coming out. And um, what was he in? Um, a Night in Miami. It, oh, that, yeah, I have to check that one out. It, it wasn't, I thought it, like, from the description of it, I thought it was going to be, like, more exciting than it was. Mm. Like, it was, it was more, like, people talking, you know, where I thought it was going to be, like, more yeah. acting. So it was just like, eh. that. like the acting was good, but it, it's nominated for all these awards and stuff. And you could tell that it's supposed to be, it's like a based off of a stage play, you know, like a serious play, like for true thespians, you know? And yeah, <laughs> it's well, you have to think. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know, why am I watching this right now? <laughs> Really uh, are you watching any new TV programs or? 
Um, I've just been watching things on. I don't. I haven't had cable in like years, so uh, I just watch things on like Netflix and YouTube. Um, because because it's too expensive. Yeah. But uh, you know, I was watching um something. I was watching that documentary about the murderers yesterday. <laughs> It was interesting. It was like this, you know, I'm not like a big conspiracy theorist person, but it made sense. (laughs) (laughs) This makes sense. Like I kind of, if you watch it, I feel like, I feel like one of the issues with that particular documentary is those QAnon people are really gonna like latch on to that. Right, yeah. Because I feel like that you could definitely probably link that to Jeffrey Epstein somehow. Oh, God. <laughs> like, have you seen it or no? No, no. <laughs> if you, you could see it and you'd be like, hmm, like, yeah, you know, maybe it, it kind of makes. If they do if they do present anything sort of like in bullet point form or just something that you can take in little pieces, it, it, they can make anything believable. Like, <laughs> yeah, but it was actually, it was, it was more than that. Like this guy, right. like had spent his like whole life, um, with this theory that the the son of sam shootings were not just done by one person they had rested like one person they were like these shootings in new york in the 80s do you do you know about them oh yeah yeah so i remember like my parents talking about them when i like was like a kid like they would make jokes you know um about like gothic people or whatever you know like <laughs> satan version of Christ. <laughs> like you know like what are you uh what are you a son of sam or whatever like joking about it but um yeah i didn't know what it was and this guy i remember seeing him on tv uh terry maury maury terry or terry maury something like that he got two first names over there mm. but uh he like dedicated his whole life to proving that it wasn't just that one person doing all the killings. And it, it actually, I was like, oh, this actually makes sense. But yeah, well, there, there are copycat everything. So, well, that it was more linked to a, like a, a cult. Of- okay. Oh, so they were connected, but not the same person. Exactly. Like it was the same organization of people. And I was like, oh, that actually makes sense. But yeah have the internet back in the day so (laughs) (laughs) or the uh dna changed the game you know oh yeah so now it's much harder much harder to get away with that kind of stuff i guess (laughs) we don't know because if they got away with it we wouldn't know (laughs) but that was interesting but and i of course i watched um uh, well, in like clips, I watch uh, SNL all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, they just had Elon Musk. Did you see that one? <laughs> yeah, I was watching it. Oh my god, I watched the. They had Wario and dressed as Wario from the Super yeah. Mario. Movie. <laughs> yeah, that was. He did the dance. So good, and the the Dogecoin. I was like, man, the Dogecoin thing was like, everyone was expecting it to go over a dollar because of like Elon Musk, but it didn't. But I don't know, that was the best $10 I ever invested, I gotta say, so. (laughs) (laughs) I've been watching a lot of Magnum PI, the new one, that's pretty cool. And and then I don't know if you've even heard of it, but there's a show called Big Sky um, and it's based in Montana. And and I spent so much time in Montana I, I I really like that show, but it, there's just like a ton of twists and turns. Is that is that a like a cop show? Um, it, well, it, it it involves Montana State Troopers. That was season one. They're in on like a human trafficking ring, but they killed off the the Montana State State Trooper. Uh, so it, it's on to season two now. I just started watching um, 
this thing called, I think it's an older series, but it's on Netflix called uh, Startup. And uh, it's oh. actually about Miami. Yeah. But it reminds me of your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, you're a big fan of Miami Vice. <laughs> Oh yeah, I love Miami Vice. Yeah. I, I just uh, I just got a pop up on my screen. My battery's going low. I'm gonna uh, just plug it in. So give me two seconds. Okay. Over here. What is the sandy bottom? Oh, it, uh, I got that at a dollar store. It's not a real bar. <laughs> Did you ever go to the comedy clubs when you're in New York? Um, actually, no. I did. I did see Jerry Seinfeld in Vegas once. What's, what's the best show you've seen in Vegas? Um, you, you're not. You're not going to believe me, but it's actually Jersey Boys. <laughs> I've seen it three times. Really? Yeah. I saw, I didn't get to see that on Broadway. I think my mom went though. She said it was really good. That was every, everybody's favorite show and like, but I'm like, it's biased, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I actually have seen like Paul Anka and um, what's the other guy? Um, oh, it was a Don Cachet guy. Don uh, Wayne Newton. It was, yeah, and uh, yeah, those guys like were like old school Vegas guys. So apparently, um, Paul Anka wrote My Way, I think it was My Way for Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra was going to retire, and Paul Anka wrote My Way and basically brought St. Frank Sinatra out of retirement. Oh, wow, that's cool! Yeah, and Paul Anka's Canadian. Ah, there you go. Some Canadian pride over there. <laughs> yeah, and Frank Sinatra's from Hoboken, New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, there you go. One thinks he's from New York. I'm like, no. But I always say, like, you can't see a, it's pretty tough to see a bad show in Vegas. Um, and I've seen all kinds of shows. Like, I saw a Motley Crue play at the, the Hard Rock. And it was hilarious because they have this big pyrotechnics show. And Tommy Lee's playing his drums and then uh, around the drums caught on fire, but it wasn't part of the show, and, but he kept on playing and the, the roadies came out and hosed down his drum kit. And then for the rest of the show, it just smelled like burnt rubber. <laughs> Did it change the sound of the drums? Um, it was just sort of on the platform in front. So like he had these flames like shooting out by his drums and then the front of it. So it was like a rising stage. So he's like up in the air and this platform caught on fire. So. Whoa. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yep, that's very rock and roll to keep playing, you know? <laughs> and then uh, I saw at the Palms, I saw the Pogues. So um the lead singer is just like this renowned alcoholic. And I, I was in the front front stage and I thought he was doing like a Dean Martin thing because he had this plastic cup and it was full of whiskey and he was like singing, but he was like swaying. But then he like fell forward and the whiskey fell like a little bit of whiskey spilt. It was real whiskey. Like he wasn't drinking iced tea. It wasn't an act. He was like bombed. That's funny. <laughs> the Pogues? The Pogues. Uh, I think the lead singer's name is McGowan, maybe. Uh, you yeah, have to look at I think Shane McGowan, but he's just like this renowned alcoholic, um, but like fantastic singer. Uh, they, they have this uh, famous Christmas song. Uh, I think something, fairy tale in New York. Uh, and they, they, they play it every Christmas, but like they're an sort of Irish Celtic, band uh, but yeah look into them the pogues a gallon that makes sense yeah <laughs> and all his teeth are falling out and, he was, and then one time he uh they were 
he was right in the middle of the song. I think he was done his drink and he just walked off stage in the middle of the song. And then the band just kind of looked and they just kept on playing for like another five minutes <laughs> instrumental <laughs> and he staggered back on. So just that in itself was entertaining. That's good. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you, uh, I think you'll have fun in Vegas. Uh, you might you might not quite get the shows or or all the uh, what it, what it was before, but uh, yeah, and definitely like lots of good meals there. Like uh, like well, a lot of celebrity chefs. Like I've eaten at Bobby Flay's. Um, I, I ate at Mario Batali. A couple of his places before he uh, <laughs> lost it all. Um, well, Bobby Flay's not. Both of those guys are not a. There's a story in, um, I guess Philly, because he he opened a bunch of like burger palaces and stuff. Yeah, there, there's one in Vegas, Bobby's Burger Palace or whatever. He's not. He's not the best guy to work for. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. And neither is well, Mario Batali. So there you go. He was skimming tips, is that right? Or that was Mario Batali for sure. Yeah. Uh, but even coming up, like Bobby Flay is, was known for like um, like copying recipes, and they say he like learned everything from his ex-wife, basically. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, he, he doesn't have a. There's definitely like, you know, circles that don't like him. <laughs> yeah. so. Uh, the be- the best burger I had in Vegas was Gordon Ramsay's, I think. I love Gordon Ramsay. People talk yeah. shit about Gordon Ramsay, but he's um, I got the, I got to go to his flagship restaurant in England, Ramsay's. Oh wow! And um, I went with my school, and we got to go like behind the scenes. He wasn't there, but we um, yeah, like we learned we. We basically got a tour from his major D, who was um, a kid. He like Gordon Ramsay, like found him when he was working as a dishwasher in a hotel at like fifteen or something. Yeah. Um, just trained, like trained him, and he was the major D. But I think he was like twenty-two at the time for a three Michelin star restaurant. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. So he was definitely like, like everything they did in there was, it was very, uh, like even the decorations, they had all these mirrors on the wall. And like, if you were just a customer, you would think they were just for decoration, but the mirrors were set up in a way where they could see every angle of the restaurant from the maitre d' stand. And the maitre d' would know if someone needs more water, if someone dropped a fork, if, like everything so and then but there was they weren't allowed to talk to each other in the dining room like the staff they could only mm-hmm. talk to guests um so they actually had this uh like sign language basically like, kind of like baseball you know yeah <laughs> we're like uh like going like this would mean like you have to go clear a table um going like this would mean something like they had all these if someone tapped you on the back like two times or three times like they would have all these different meanings for that um so it was completely silent so the guests wouldn't be distracted by the staff and it was just like like that's crazy (laughs) (laughs) and then they were uh he showed us how to um decanter a port like an old port, like they would like strain it through cheesecloth at the table and they would have to like test it. They had something to do with a candle where they would see like clarity to make sure it was like a good bottle of wine or something. Then they would pour it through because like the cork would kind of disintegrate sometimes. So they didn't want it in the wine. But uh, when, when you get to a certain level of uh, dining, like things get crazy. You know? <laughs> yeah. so. What do you think of Giada De Laurentiis? Is that the one with the teeth? Yeah. <laughs> I, w- I was crushing on her for a while. I, I went to, I, and I went to her restaurant in Vegas. Uh, she's got one in the, in the Cromwell. 
and it's uh, fantastic. But I, and I had a Negroni, which was which is one of my favorite drinks, and that's an Italian type drink. Uh, but the the kicker was they they got um, the the twist from an orange, and then they lit it on fire to release the oils. So you had a burnt oin- orange essence in your drink. <laughs> I love doing that. Yeah. Like when I made a, I guess an old fashioned. I made it and I did that, and it just you if you burn it, but then you want to take it and uh like rim the outside of the glass with it so you get the oh, straight yeah. on there and then put it in there and it's it just takes it to the next level it's so good we have a uh, little um i mean i have a big blowtorch but my boyfriend found this where is it i'll show you it's so cool <laughs> it's almost like a pen Mm -hmm. like like this and because i hate those mini bow torches you know the ones that look like little guns you know what i'm talking about Yeah. yeah oh yeah um so this one you just push it up and you can't okay. see the flame. There we go. Yeah. Um, you can trim brulee with it, right? You could, yeah. I use the big one for the brulee. Oh, right, okay. But this one, I use, I use it for for the uh, oranges, for anything where I need like, like a lot of control is what I use the smaller one for because it's not as heavy. But the um, it's perfect for that. And I love that because it has safeties on it. Like it has a lock on it. So like, you know, a little kid or something isn't gonna do anything. And um, it's got like the adjustment for the flame. But I hate the the guns because the uh, the space, like where they put the safeties. And mm. sometimes they, when you turn them on, it's not a release trigger. It's like you turn it on and it's on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then you have to like move the safety and do this to turn it off and it's like it's so dangerous like i know more people have gotten burnt with those things than with the the one i have like the giant one i have at home depot you know so. yeah actually when when i was um 15 years old i blew up my parents kitchen i did like two thousand dollars worth of damage <laughs> so i i was home i had mono so I like I was in and out of sleeping, and I, I decided I was going to make a deep fry some potato patties. Um, so I, I had the hot oil, and I put the potato patties in, and I think I must have fell asleep or something. All of a sudden, it was like, Phew. and and so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll remain calm. Like I, I I think I saw somewhere where if you put um, baking is it baking soda or baking powder on it, it'll like um, it, it'll kill the oxygen and the flame will go out so i had this big uh, pot of burning oil high flame so i, I go to put the baking uh, soda on it but it's uh corn it was cornstarch and it somehow made it combustible <laughs> it just, there was um it exploded and the potato patty ended up on the side of the room um the entire roof was like black uh, I was lucky. I blinked and I got hot oil on my eyelid. Like I had a blister on my eyelid. I, I, I still got like scars on my arm to this day. Like, Whoa. and um, yeah, so- flour, like cornstarch and like flour, they're highly combustible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that would have made a good YouTube video. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, you always you gotta cover the grease fire. I know. Yeah. Well, I was fifteen. I didn't. Know. Yeah. <laughs> 15 yeah, but at least you didn't put water on it yeah at least you knew that but like oh my god i remember a lot of the times when i was traveling uh because i bake all the time and my um for a long time i would have to carry my like i would travel places to cook and f- i would have flour in everything so i would get stopped constantly because 
when they did the the powder tests on me, I would always come up positive. <laughs> 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 and then I'd have to talk to them and they told me like, oh, that's, that's, it's from the flower. And I was like, that's weird. But with that story, now it makes sense. <laughs> crazy wow yeah i guess that <laughs> it's amazing that i like to cook now because like for, and for years i was just scared of hot oil <laughs> but uh, i mean i'm still afraid of hot oil you gotta be careful yeah. with that oh yeah yeah but i remember even with like you don't realize i have a deep fryer and i didn't realize it was plugged in and we we're like what is that that smell because in a small apartment, like the ventilation isn't that good. And it was just like, everyone's eyes were getting like, you know, irritated and tearing. We're like, what is going on? And we had left the, the fryer on, like um, not just on low, like I thought it was off, but it was like on low. And, yeah. you know, you really need good ventilation for those things. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, it's 310, so I think I got to start doing <laughs> You're going to do some editing, chop a bunch of... <laughs> no, I'm just going to put it on. I'm sure uh, people will, you know, they'll probably get bored around the, yeah. us talking about TV. <laughs> they like, they're just talking about nonsense now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But... Uh, it was great to have you well, on. Thank you very much. I, I thought I'd be nervous, but I, I, I wasn't. You're very charming and delightful, and I, I, I was happy to talk with you. It was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. You're like, you know what's funny? You're the first person in real life that I've ever met named Chad. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, but that's what I was going to ask you. Chappie is, is that a common nickname for people named Chad? No, uh, my hockey coach gave it to me when I was 13 years old. He just started calling me Chappie. But I think there was a, a famous, uh, another famous hockey coach in that area. Uh, he coached the Lethbridge Broncos and his name was John Chapman. And they called him Chappie. So I don't know what, why my hockey coach called me Chappie, but that, it just stuck. <laughs> I'm glad I asked because I really thought it was just, I was going to. You know, if I ever met another person named Chad, I was going to be like, hey, Chad, he was up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that, was he like a funny guy? That's probably why. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was always joking around. And, and yeah. So, and I, I was like 13 at the time. So I'm just like, a dumb, dumb kid. Okay. Call me whatever you want. So, okay. Um, <laughs> I got a nickname now. I'm cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm cool. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for coming on. Can't wait to see right. your, uh, your Yeah, you take care. And uh, it, it, actually, I, I have a segment on my show called Best Tropical Destination Stories. So if you ever think of one, shoot, shoot me over a tropical destination story. Oh, I have a... I know you have a ton, bro. <laughs> I, live in a, I live in a tropical destination. Well, yeah, your life is a tropical destination story. Yeah, well, for now, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, I think the most tropical place I've ever been to is definitely Thailand. Like, that was... Have you ever been there? I have, yeah. Yeah, that was, like... I, I went to Pattaya, though, so that's, like, you could see where, it, like, uh, how a single guy could just get into every kind of vice known to man, so... I probably didn't like it that much. It was just like, just just want to get out of here before I get some kind of addiction or something. So. All right. Yeah, that's, on that note. No. On that note. All right. Let's see. Okay. Thanks, Grace. You're welcome. Okay. Take care.